How are you? And I would think that everyone knows that trade produces jobs. So we know that 14% of all EU labor, 9% of US labor is attributable to trade. And because we are each other's largest trading partners at over a trillion dollars a year in goods and services, a pretty healthy proportion of those numbers relate specifically to this trade. But now we're at the dawn of what people say are the, is the fourth industrial revolution that has breathtaking change, the pace of change in social and technology has given way and is giving way to issues of protectionism, fear, and isolationism. It's interesting the topics that we're going to talk about, the three, trade, inequality, and technology, have an interesting relationship with one another. Two of them, trade and technology, many people believe contribute to inequality. And justifiably or not, inequality gives rise to pessimism and protectionism. Worldwide, the share of the top 1% own 20% of all income and wealth. Kind of back to pre-World War I days, the Gilded Age, when in places in the West, vast inequity existed between income and wealth. Now, this is not just a US issue, and it's not just a UK issue. It's a European issue. And moreover, it's a European issue as well in states that we don't normally associate with inequality, the egalitarian states. Sweden and Finland. But technology is also giving way to a change in the demand for higher educated workers. Men and women are losing their jobs because they don't have the skills necessary. The broader workforce is not keeping up with the pace of change required. And it's, it shows in many of the unemployment statistics that we have today, there is a vast difference in unemployment between those who have college and university degrees and those who have just high school or secondary degrees. And it's more pronounced in the US than it is in Europe. So for example, if you're a high school graduate only with no college degree, you are twice as likely to be unemployed today as you would if you had a college degree. The displacement of workers uh, by technology is viewed as a problem as a result of globalization. And because it's viewed as globalization, there's a lack of trust in trade. Trade gets discredited. Economists would tell us, however, that trade produces more growth than, be, than can be created otherwise. And restraining trade, restraining trade only has the effect of lowering prices, stifling innovation, reducing growth, and probably most severely impacting those who can least afford to be impacted. And so some of the things that have come out in the last 12 hours, and probably more importantly, you know, what's the next trigger after that, and what's the next step after that, are worrisome. Protectionism may create some jobs, but it'll eliminate far more. We do need to worry, though, about the globalization aspect, where people have been displaced, where people feel like they've been left behind, where people feel like they don't have hope. And we see its manifestation, whether it be in Brexit, perhaps contributing to the Trump, Trump election, and in the rise of extreme political parties that we see in Italy, France, Germany, and other places throughout the world. We need to be asking what's the role of business and what's the role of policymakers in helping to shape a different outcome. So if you're a 50-year-old person who loses their job because you don't have the skill set necessary, what do you do? Do you get retrained? I'll just speak for myself. I've, I'm a little older than 50, but if I lose my job, I don't know what I would do. I don't know if I have the ability to deal with some of the new economy. So what's the role of the policymakers and the role of business relative to compensation policy, retirement policy, pension policy, medical. Deloitte recently did a survey of 1,600 senior executives throughout the world. About 87% of them said that through technology, we will reduce inequality over the next many years. 75% said that businesses 
will influence the outcome far more than government. Now, I don't know if I'm in the 87% camp yet, but I'm clearly in the 75% camp. I think businesses hold the key. Finally, innovation. We have had tremendous innovation in the last many years. How our innovation has not been matched with productivity increases. Why? Because the pace of change in technology, candidly, is more than we can absorb. We can't keep pace with everything that technology does. We don't have that ability to do so. And why is productivity important? Well, economists would say productivity is important because as, pro as productivity moves, real wages move as well. And so in the US, from 1995 to 2003, productivity increased by 3% a year. Since 2013, less than a percent a year. In Europe, it's been worse. And that low productivity increase started back in 2003. And just to compound things, real wage growth has been less than productivity. And so what happens when you don't have real wage growth? You have more inequality. And it just exasperates the issues that we have. I, come, I live in Kansas City uh, in the US. Show of hands, how many have been to Kansas City before? Wow, <laughs> kind of blew my next line. Um, <laughs> so in Kansas City, we still believe in the American dream. It's still alive. We believe in hard work, getting ahead, finding a job that not only pays the bills, but hopefully a career that provides meaningful work, self-respect, dignity when you enter your twilight years. We've seen some of the story before around inequality in trade and technology. We've seen how technology and societal changes have helped eliminate or reduce some of what occurred after World War I, after World War II, where in part the Marshall Plan was part of the solution. I am an optimist. I do believe that we will beat this. I do believe that we, can, we will come together and figure out solutions for it. But I'm just the scene setter. So with that, I thank you very much. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Europe editor for CNN, Ms. Nina Dos Santos. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, this is a great honor for me to uh, present and moderate yet another uh, one of these panels on the issue of uh, trade and rebuilding trust in trade here at the Brussels Forum. I've counted over the years that I have moderated five of these panels, and during this time, the narrative vis-a-vis -vis trade has changed radically. So uh, without further ado, let's just introduce a little video to frame the discussion that we're going to be having before I introduce our two esteemed guests. We have been through turbulent times before. Volatility is nothing new. We have seen economies rise and fall, new technologies emerge, and mass movements of people many times over. There is an established playbook for dealing with global challenges. Does the playbook still work? We may know the challenges we face all too well, but it's not enough to just try what's worked before. We know that copying the policies of the past will not resolve the challenges of the present. We can draw inspiration from our successes, but we need to spark fresh thinking. We need to rewrite the playbook. We need to revise, reboot, and rebuild. Build trust. So we're now in the era of tariffs, uh, whereas in years gone by, we've talked about uh, trade. Um, 
with the uh, signing yesterday of significant tariffs on steel and aluminium, this is obviously a huge hot news topic. And I'm delighted to say that we have somebody who can respond uh, first off on that. The EU's Trade Commissioner, Celia Malmström, is with us today. And we're also in the company of Bob Zelik, who, as many of you here in the room know, is the former president of the World Bank, former US trade negotiator, and he's currently the chairman of Alliance Bernstein. Uh, to our guests, welcome. Thank you very much. So let's start out with the obvious big question of the day, and that's obviously addressed to you, uh, Commissioner uh, Malmström. We now have the prospect of large tariffs on steel and aluminium. The EU has an arsenal that it can rebuff these with, but uh, how confident are you that the EU will actually be among those countries that will have those tariffs imposed? How much room is there for dialogue? And if not, how far are you prepared to go to rebuff these? Well, dialogue is always the prime option of the European Union, uh, and we are reaching out. We have been in talks with the, the, our American friends for quite some time to explain to them that whereas we, we share the concern of overcapacity in the steel sector, uh, this is not the right way to deal with it. And it is certainly not the right way to exclude, uh, to include Europe in that, because we are friends, we are allies, we work together, we cannot possibly be a threat to, to national security in the US, so we are counting on being excluded. Uh, it's not crystal clear what was uh, in what the president said yesterday, so we will have to seek uh, further clarity on that. Fortunately, uh, we have scheduled since a long time, actually, for, for different reasons, a meeting tomorrow with uh, USTR uh, Ambassador Lighthizer, so hopefully he can give us some clarity on this. What would be your ideal outcome from that meeting, and how far are you prepared to go if that meeting doesn't go well? Well, it is a meeting tomorrow. It is not the decision of, of everything. Uh, it, it's because also our friends, uh, the Japanese minister is there because we have this trilateral where we discuss, among other things, steel over capacity. Um, well, we, we hope that we can get confirmation that the EU is excluded from, from, from this uh, and that we can go on to continue our dialogue on how to deal with, with the problem uh, with, with the US and Japan and others. If not, well, we have been very clear that, that we, we think this is not in compliance with WTO, so we will go to WTO, possibly with some other friends. Uh, we will have to protect our industry with rebalancing measures, safeguards, and we are also preparing uh, among, with the member states a list of rebalancing balancing measures that could possibly enter into force. We hope that will not be the case, of course, because nobody has an interest of escalating this situation, but we, if we have to do that, that is what we will do. I want to come back to the WTO <coughs> and some of your other uh, options on the table here in a second, but I, I want to ask you, Bob Zelik, what do you think is really going on here? Is this just about 20-odd percent tariffs <laughs> on <me>. steel, 15% <laughs> percent tariffs on aluminium, or is it part of something bigger that won't necessarily end here? Well, first, let me thank the commissioner. I'm sure that uh, these are challenging days for her, and uh, she's tried to approach all this in a very uh, professional and sort of reasonable fashion, and it's nice for her to spend some time with people here today. Um, so following up on your question, Nina, let me try to give you a sense. You know, trade wonkery loses people easily, so let me give you a little <laughs> sense of what I think this has different connections and a little bit where also this might go. So number one, uh, you see some of the economics work about what would be the effect of tariffs on, on the economy. And they break Someone things, for example. Someone is already angry, huh? <laughs> uh, uh, God knows what they're going to do the next time, or the next point of it. Um, then, then the second sort of round is what happens in terms of retaliation, whether rebalancing. And this is the big risk in trade areas, always the risk of escalation. Um, but third, what's important uh, to note here is that the authority you use also signals something. And the U.S. is now trying to use this national security authority. It's under our domestic law called 232. And while this is uh, part of the WTO charter, it's rarely used because it basically it becomes the escape valve for everything. So from a U.S. perspective, people might talk about food security and therefore block a lot of food exports. So that's opening a door here that's mm -hmm. going to be sort of very important. The fourth connection, which you see even in the uh, news coming out yesterday, is what will this do to the ongoing NAFTA negotiations? 
Um, because what the Trump administration has said is, well, we won't apply this to Mexico and Canada now, but in a sense they're trying to use it as leverage in the negotiations. Then uh, a fifth point, which is just over the horizon, but very important for people to be aware of, is there's a so-called 301 investigation of Chinese intellectual property. And they'll undoubtedly find various violations, but I think neither the Chinese nor perhaps the administration knows exactly what they're going to do. But you can see in the press discussions that President Trump keeps coming back and saying, I really want to go after China. Well, this will be the opportunity, and we'll see what flows from that. But then the next connection is also that if you combine the national security with the China policy, beware of what's going to happen in the investment area. So if I had to guess, my guess is one of the retaliatory measures would be to limit Chinese investment. And, then, and if you start to use national security in this, that opens doors that you see in the European discussion with the member states uh, as well as with the commission. And in the case of the US, there's legislation going forward with something called CFIUS, the Commission on Foreign Investment in the United States. So this is going to bleed into sort of investment areas as well. Then the other point, it would be does how this would affect the negotiations with Korea on a free trade agreement. And then the bottom line issue on this, which is the core <coughs> point of trying to understand what the administration is doing is that President Trump has long believed in Wilbur Ross and Bob Lighthizer that bilateral trade deficits are like negative net income for a business person. It's losing. Now, you don't find many economists that would share this view other than Peter Navarro, mm. but it fundamentally changes how you negotiate because if you see what they're doing, and again, this helps you understand a little bit what's in the news, the president just said he wants to reduce the trade deficit with China by $100 billion. He first said a billion, then somebody corrected him to $100 billion. What the logic is, is they're trying to change the outcome and adjust rules to achieve that. That's fundamentally different than the way trade negotiations have worked in the past, where you try to have fair rules for competition and Frankly, trade balances depend on other factors, comparative advantage, savings and investment, but that's not the logic that the administration has here. Well, so the bottom line, Nina, is mm -hmm. expect more. It depends somewhat on the blowback that they get, but the underlying ideology, if I would suggest it, which is also tied to the president's political base, um, is that this is, this is the first shot of what we're going to see is an increasing volley. Well, we'll come to the political base in a second, and I do want to obviously asked that obvious question, which is, why is it for your blue-collar worker who's working in a steel mill, why is this kind of protectionist mechanism so bad? They will be asking themselves, what's your answer to that, Bob Zelle? Well, first off, if you, you're going to lose jobs from people that now will have to pay more for steel, and again, whether you all kind of call it blue-collar, white-collar, frankly, I don't think you have to get in class distinctions. A job's a job. So if you have higher tariffs for solar panels and that people would install solar panels lose jobs, if you basically are going to use pipe for various energy activities, they're going to lose jobs. So. Look, it's the nature of a localized and sometimes sort of national trade policy that various interest groups will claim that they need protection. But it's going to cost somebody else, either in terms of jobs and consumption. So, you know, if some of the analysis for the Peterson Institute of International Economics, for example, showed that all the different trade agreements over the course of years saves the average American family, using sort of three members of it, about $10,000 a year. So. It's a tax. If you like taxes, you like tariffs. This is a, th this is a narrative that also uh, carries some weight, uh, Commissioner, here in Europe as well. There are people who say, well, we should be protect protecting our own industries, particularly the fading ones, like, for instance, steel and aluminium. I mean, when we're talking about rebuilding trust in trade, that's a narrative that has to be tackled. You have to be able to speak directly to those people as well, because they're part of your constituency. Yes, uh, and, and th that is a fact with globalization, and that is not new. The, qu the question, the, the difference is that things are happening so quickly now, but, but jobs have always disappeared. There has been new jobs, there has been new technology. Now there are robots, artificial intelligence, but in the past there were other things. So old jobs disappear, new come. But it goes very quickly. So of course, the, but the, the answer cannot be massive state support to dying industries. We have seen that in the past. It is not uh, the solution, or high tariffs. Uh, 
protectionism is also not the, the, the solution on this. Uh, but what we need to do, and this is of course very difficult, you need to make sure that these people can work either in the same area but on, on a higher level, uh, that they get training, that they get skills, that the notion that you have a job and then you keep it for 65, for five, 50 years and you get a, a watch, that, that is over. You have to be able to change much more quickly. So member states in the European Union and of course all across the world need to invest much more in those skills, training, education, making sure that people feel comfortable in moving, you know, every, every third or fourth year. But if or they so, don't you know. want to move, which is part of the problem yeah, that, that we're is facing a problem. today, and then, yeah. how do you tackle that? Well, because some people would reply to your answer and say, oh, well, the liberal elite is lecturing us. I can tell you that time and time again I've reported on issues mm. like Brexit, and that was a subject that came up and was very hotly felt by mm. the people mm. of the United Kingdom, for instance, mm. on the factory floor. You know, I meet these people uh, all the time uh, as well, but, but that, 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 that is a fact. You cannot stop globalization. What you can do is that you can try to shape it, you can try to make sure that those who lose out uh, are, are protected via social security systems and so on, but, but also making sure that, that, that skills, uh, training, that, that, that they, they are there. And because so, some of these jobs will disappear. That is inevitable. But there will be new jobs. There will be jobs today that we can't, uh, to, tomorrow that we can't even imagine today. Uh, and people need to be prepared for that. Uh, Bob Zellick, it's true that sort of about half a billion people um, have seen their lives around the world improved by big free trade deals that you mm -hmm. yourself championed. About 800 million. 800 million <laughs> to 500 million, depending on who, who you talk to. Um, but the reality, and if you talk to some people who are totally anti-trade, perhaps none. The reality is, though, is that... Um, some of these, some people have been told for a long time, different, you need, you'll need different skills, there'll be different jobs for you. You maybe have been a steel worker yesterday, but we can retrain you and you can work in, say, I don't know, another aspect of that factory. And it's true, for some of these jobs, people haven't been able to make the transition. That transition just hasn't actually been no. there. No. So what is the answer here to sort of rebuild the narrative to make sure that it is there? Because this, I hate to dis make the distinction between blue collar and white collar, but this with automation will become a white collar problem eventually as well. Sure. Well, um, as the commissioner said, you have to help people adapt to change because people will get scared. Um, but going a little bit to your point, it depends on, on a societal's choice, but I think you also want people to accept some responsibility. So if you don't want to move and you don't want to change and you don't want to work, well, you know, you have to decide, do you want to support that person or do you want to try to help them make the adjustment? Now, the government programs on this, you know, have been mixed, okay? Uh, in the case of the United States, the United States spends about $18 billion a year on worker adjustment. There were about 49 different programs and nine different agencies. <laughs> There's now about 40. Um, in my sense, they don't work very well. Um, so I think there's a role here for experimentation about different types of things. People have talked about wage insurance, other sort of notions, even helping with mobility. I honestly think, from my practical experience, the private sector is going to have to play a key role here. Mm. So I, I listened to Randall Stevenson, who's the CEO of AT&T. And he, and it's one of, one of the, if not the biggest employer in the United States. And what he's talked about is they're explaining to their workforce today kind of which jobs are going away, which jobs will be created, what you have to do in terms of skills for those jobs, how you get certified for that. They're working with Coursera to be able to help the certification process. And he explained they were spending about three cents a share in this process. So I think this is going to be uh, an area where you need sort of a combination private and public. I think the education systems are gonna have to change. I think you're gonna move more towards certification of skills than sort of traditional degrees. This is where some of the technology variations could help. But coming back to, again, Cecilia's point, you know, and the government policies, it would be a lot better if the types of benefits you had were linked to people as opposed to jobs. So this is a problem in the United States where some of the health care and some of the mm. other benefit systems are not mobile. Because you're right, you have to help people deal with the fears. On the other hand, you know, this is where you have to decide whether people are going to assume some responsibility. My grandfather worked for Western Union. That was, doesn't exist anymore. My father worked for Illinois Bell Telephone. That's changed. My brother worked in the technology space. You know, so where there's a little bit of when I listen to some of these people act like they're supposed to be able to continue to do the job people did 100 years ago, 
Well, look at farmers. In 1900, 40% of Americans were farming. Now it's one or 2%, but they're much more productive. So there's a combination here about alerting people, helping people change, but also assuming some responsibility because protectionism won't be the answer. And my father worked in the steel sector, so let's get back to steel. Um, <laughs> And, and so I did my uncle, lie. and guess what? <laughs> so did my grandfather. And, yeah, and, and my <laughs> cousin's go. a Navy SEAL, so he went to a different field. So. So, so the reality is, is that we've been here before, talking about steel tariffs. I remember my father talking about it over the dinner table <laughs> in rather incandescent tones back in the year 2000. Um, let's just quickly examine again, as you were saying before, Commissioner, uh, what the options on the table are if, say, for instance, dialogue doesn't necessarily cut it. Um, you've identified a number of goods that you could impose punitive measures on. You said that you do have appetite for a fight at the WTO. How much appetite do you really have for a fight at the WTO? And if, indeed, uh, you get into this long protracted battle, you end up winning, does the United States become disengaged from the very system that it helped to create? And what's going to be the ramifications of that? Well, it's not that we are looking for a battle. I mean, we didn't start But you're prepared this. for one. The, the European Union is a peace project. We have dialogue and compromise as our god. Uh, th that, that is the whole idea with the European Union. We didn't ask for this. What we are, are asking is to our American friends and others, work with us. Work with us to strengthen the international organization, the global playbook, as the video sa said here. They might need to change. Yes, let's work to do that together, to shape the future globalization. We have always worked together. We should do this now as well. Now, if the U United States decide to do this, this is deeply unfortunate. And we will do everything we can to convince that that is wrong. If it does happen, we will have to take some measures to protect our, our jobs and workers as well. So l let's mm -hmm. go through those measures. Mm -hmm. About $3.5 billion worth of goods that you've identified. I'm not going to get into orange juice futures well, you with can. you, because I understand, whiskey, Commissioner, you spent well, the last two days Talking about uh, Levi's juice, jeans, whiskey, peanut butter, everything you have for iconic, breakfast. iconic American products, and so on and mm -hmm. so forth. How quickly could you impose retaliatory tariffs on U.S. goods? Because obviously, they could do this within 15 days on steel yes. and aluminium. How? What's your time frame? Well, we will need slightly longer time. Of course, we will seek to 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 uh, go to WTO with with some other friends, uh, apparently, because we deeply think this is not justified, uh, then we will uh, Im possibly impose some, some safeguards on our own al aluminium and um, uh, steel industry. Uh, and then these uh, rebalancing measures, it's a list that we're working on, it's still not fixed, it's discussed wi wi with member states, but, but there are rules on how to do this, and we are making sure that we comply by the book with WTO rules. So the moment the, the uh, of entering into force of the American uh, action, if we are affected, we have maximum 90 days uh, to, to, to do that. But we can, with, when all these 90 days are done, there will be consultation with the industry, uh, there will be a, how, a process how long of transparency. could that take? Because obviously the EU isn't known for acting quickly. No, with so we many countries are 28 to countries, uh, so we, we need to uh, internally discuss. But the, the WTO rule says that within 90 days it has to be in place. Uh, that doesn't mean that when the 90 days are gone that we will impose them. We can choose not to. We can wait a little bit to see how things develop. But within 90 days we will have to be ready to do it. Can, can I just comment on Because, again, just to draw out for people to understand this, and I, I think the Commission has been quite shrewd on this. Remember I mentioned that the... U.S. administration is using Section 232 mm -hmm. authority. If you listen to the commissioner, she's treating it as a 201 safeguard, because under 201 mm -hmm. safeguards, there is the ability to take some countervailing action in a short period of time. Yeah. Under 232, or under national security, it's not really clear <laughs> kind of what those are. So they're, they're interpreting it as 201. And, but the reason why this is important is you know, if they bring an action against the national security in the WTO, here's the risk. The WTO says, um, well, the EU or whoever brings the action is right. This isn't really national security. And things that the Trump administration has said have undermined their own case. But then what happens when Wilbur Ross or somebody else says, wait a minute. Those people in Geneva can decide what is in America's national security. Should we be part of the WTO? Or the reverse, the WTO says, well, we let countries decide their own national security. Then you've created a very big loophole. And the important other piece to connect in this is that 
the way the WTO works, you have panels, and then you have a right to appeal. And there is a body of seven people that are supposed to form these three-person panels. This actually started in the Obama administration, but the Trump administration has continued. They blocked new people coming into that appellate body. So there are now only four, as opposed to seven, and some of those terms will roll off. So the important part here, going back a little bit to the systemic points that Cecilia mentioned, is without it being so obvious and apparent, you could be dismantling the WTO dispute resolution system. Do you think that's really what's going on then? Do you think that could be the eventual outcome here? Because the WTO has faced criticism for some time. So do you think that eventually this is the Do I think that's what the, the administration unraveling? has in mind? Yes, that's what Are the they... administration has in mind. And you, you can see it. I mean, but you Ambassador think Lighthizer happen? has said that he would prefer the old GATT system to the WTO. And again, I'm trying to avoid sort of trade wonkery here, but it's important that people understand because this is what's the, what the pathway is. Under the old GATT system, you could have a panel decide, but a country could block the action. Mm -hmm. Under the WTO, a country can still say, no, we won't do it, but then the other party has the right to retaliate. Ambassador Lighthizer has said he wants to go back to the GATT system. And if you kill the appellate body, I suppose that will be sort of a variation. So these guys are playing hardball here, and it fits into the whole notion that they don't really see the systemic aspects of this. They see it as transactional. They see it as case by case. Clearly, that's how President Trump operates. And that goes to the core question of how will the international system operate if the United States is no longer playing a systemic role. And what we haven't touched on, but you may wish to, is that it's not only the bad things that happen, but it's the opportunity costs of not working, for example, with the EU on the real issues with China, which are the technology and innovation sector. And indeed, you're going to have the opportunity to be talking with the United States and the Japanese trade representatives uh, tomorrow to talk about some of these real issues, mm -hmm. like, for instance, uh, China, and so on and so forth. Is there a risk, as Bob Selleck says, that the United States and other countries okay. are getting distracted by 25% tariffs on things like steel, that these very blunt measures could prove to be such a distraction, it could really mask other significant problems that another administration will have to deal with in three or four years' time? Well, uh, as I said, the, the, the problems on the appellate body that, that was just referred to, we share the concerns there, and the whole world does. Actually, it is a unanimous uh, worry here against uh, what the US is doing on blocking the, the, the appointment of the arbitrators to the appellate body. So this is the crown jewel of the WTO, and, and it needs to function. So, of course, we are discussing with... A lot I mean, the whole world, how, how to, to preserve this, or are there alternative measures, or what, what can we do to do this? This is also an issue that will be raised tomorrow. Uh, and we have said to, to, to the US, together with the Japanese, that we do share this uh, worry about some of the things that is happening in China that uh, Robert just referred to, and also the overcapacity. It's not only that, it's also technology, it's investments in cyber, and, and some other issues. And this could be a platform to discuss, you know, Japan, EU, uh, US, quite big economies, uh, friends and allies in m many regards. So this is what we intend to create this little tri trialogue. Of course, now it will obviously be dominated by, by issues related to steel and, and uh, 232. Um, and, and we hope to get more clarity tomorrow. Uh, but, 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 but this is what, what we, we can offer, a dialogue on things of common concern. And we think there are better ways to handle this than to, to just impose global tariffs uh, like this, because it will severely disturb the whole global trading system. So, but so Nina, I'm going to see your your idea that it's a distraction, and I'm going to raise you. So it's an unusual thing in the panel. I'm going to push the moderator to realize that it's actually more dangerous. The, the, at the same time you have the steel, you have an announcement about TPP. So the 11 exactly other countries going day. to four. And the point is, as, you, as the economy changes, as you were saying, you have to adapt the rules. So you have to adapt rules for e-commerce. You have to adapt rules for data protection, privacy, a whole series of issues, by the way, that are going to be very contentious on the US-EU side. And so the process is, how, how do you make rules to adapt? So it's not just that it's a distraction. It's that it's your, the US is failing to play a role to come up with rules or be part of other countries with rules for those critical sectors. So you want to talk about steel. The United States service sector is about 80% of the GDP. Shouldn't we have some rules for that? And on the technology and innovation, the core issue is 
China's been extremely clear about trying to move up the value added chain, and they've identified about 10 sectors that they want to do this in. There's an excellent report from the EU Chamber of Commerce called China, on China Manufacturing 2025. There's some things that China could do that would be very good, stronger intellectual property rights, some that are going to create huge mm -hmm. clashes. And so I'll be interested to find out afterwards whether the commissioner and Bob Lighthizer spend much time talking about whether we're going to have a combined agenda on technology in China. So far, the U.S. administration basically says, we don't like it, we'll use that as a justification to raise barriers as opposed to remove barriers. So that's what's at stake here beyond the steel and what we call aluminum. Yeah, yeah. and we call aluminum. <laughs> aluminum. Um, <laughs> point taken. Uh, let's start out by taking some questions from the audience, because I'm sure that people in the audience will want to start sort of uh, engaging with our um, two panelists. Yes, thank you very much. Could I ask you to uh, obviously identify yourself? Sure. Ignacio Guardans, uh, Director for Europe for the Transatlantic Business Council. Uh, in this contest. Uh, one, one question for the Commissioner. You have, of course, according to the treaties, all the power to lead these, but you need the support of Member States. Do you have any concern regarding the unity of Member States in everything you are preparing for the next months? Uh, how, how are you dealing with, with you know, the consensus you need from different Member States? Is there any, any tension, anything you can comment on that? <laughs> Uh, well, obviously, we do this in very close cooperation with the member states. The Commission doesn't trade with anybody. We are coordinating and leading the, 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 the trade policy. But uh, on this, uh, of course, we have been discussing very, very closely with member states on all levels, and we are in constant uh, contact, not only on this famous list, uh, but, but also uh, on, on the concerns uh, on this. So it, it, it is important. The EU is, is a very important trade block, of course. Our unity depends on how, how much we can, we can agree. But on this, I, I feel comfortable that um, so far it's been, you know, there are of course always d discussions, but uh, we've had very strong uh, support on this uh, on all levels, and we hope that we will continue to have so. Commissioner Manson, can I just add a question to <laughs> the gentleman's Ignacio. question? Um, no? Ignacio's question. Um, we are the UK friends. could be a thorn in the side, though, because technically it's still a member of the European Union, mm -hmm. uh, Absolutely. but there have been hints that potentially the UK could be exempt from these kind of steel tariffs. Um, have you had any resistance from the UK, for instance, at the moment? Because obviously they're uh, in the thick of negotiating Brexit. Will they be an awkward partner? The, U the UK, th they are a member of the European Union for another year, uh, roughly. And uh, we have, of course, talked to, to London and to, to the ministers there as well. Uh, there are different rumours about that could be excluded and that could be excluded. And, and it is not crystal clear what came from, from the president yesterday. And that's why we will see clarity. Uh, but our presumption is that the EU is, is a whole body and, and that, that the U, U, US will respect that. Otherwise, that is questioning the whole EU as a project, which is quite dramatic. And uh, the, our UK friends have, have been crystal clear in, in working on European unity here. So, I so, haven't so they're seen that on problem. board? Of course they are, yes. For the time being. And I, well, yes, unfortunately, they will be leaving us. That, that, that is sad, but that's how it is. Uh, and I think also it is in their interest that we act, if we have to act together uh, as well, because the uh, UK has an important steel industry. Of course it does, yes. Mm -hmm. um, let's take another question from the audience. Uh, we have a gentleman there. Daniel Gross from the Center for European Policy Studies here in Brussels. Um, so far, it seems that the U.S. is the only major trading power which tries to actively undermine the WTO system. Is there a chance that the rest of the world gets together and copies something which we have in the EU, which we call enhanced cooperation, so that uh, everybody except the U.S. agrees to actually be bound by WTO, WTO rules and creates their own uh, panel? That a question to me? I think the, the question was for you, whether you would support it politically, and for Bob, well, whether that would be technically possible. Well, the WTO exists, and it has 164 members, and it is true that the US has some problems with it, but at the last ministerial conference in Buenos Aires, just before Christmas, it was not only US who blocked uh, a consensus there, I have to say. There were a couple of, a handful of other countries who, who were not very helpful. Uh, so it's not only US um, who is guilty in that. It is true that, that the WTO 
even if member states are, are committed to defend it, to the multilateral system, to the appellate body and the dispute settlement mechanism, which is very important, um, th that it has not been able to make decisions on all these issues that are important, e-commerce, uh, SMEs, uh, transparency, rules for different things. And there is a frustration because it has been, you know, creating 164 unanimity is difficult. 28 is difficult enough. Uh, so, so there is a, a sensation that maybe we should move on. Coalition of the willing. There were, I think, 80 countries who signed uh, to, to work on e-commerce, for instance, to set up some basic global rules. And th these were different countries, and rich and poor, uh, east and west, north and south, including the US, that we could work on this in an open way, um, so that everybody can join if they want, but on a plurilateral basis, in a parallel to the WTO. There are other issues that are being discussed there as well. So that may, might be, be a, a way forward. Uh, because I, I, even if some countries are not very cooperative in, in, in the WTO, I, I'm not sure they, they, they still want, want to preserve it. So creating a parallel WTO is not on the agenda. So uh, let me take this from a slightly different side. I, I, I think actually the risk is of greater fragmentation. Um, and the, the reference point that I would give you, um, which actually I think was even in a Wall Street Journal editorial today, um, when you look at the some of the people who go back and analyze the causes of the Great Depression, obviously monetary policy, but also trade policy. As you probably know, there was a very well-known economic historian, Charles Kindleberger, who talked about the role of systemic leadership. And in basic point on the trade area, his argument in the 30s was Britain uh, had the experience, but no longer the capacity to provide a systemic leadership. The U.S. had the capacity, but not the experience. And so he pointed that as one of the causes. I think that's one of the dangers that you're going to run into now, in that while people can criticize the role the U.S. has taken over various decades, it still had a commitment to try to drive the system forward, whether with free trade agreements, WTO, and others. What The reason I've tried to describe the elements that I have is that you're now seeing the United States move to a transactional model actually undermining the system. And then the question is, who will step up? Now, I think you'll see pieces. So, for example, to their credit, I think Japan played a very important role in reviving the TPP. Mm -hmm. And that's not historically how Japan played trade. No. Japan was normally the laggard in the yeah. process. The EU is trying to go forward with some free trade agreements. I think that's a constructive step to be able to take. Um, but the real question is if the U.S. not only becomes sort of a... Uh, uh, Silent but recalcitrant on the system, you know, will it will it start to come apart? And I and there are, certainly are other protectionist forces around that will will add to this. So that's the real danger you're talking about here. And it's significant because you know markets tend to look at so these individual actions piecemeal. And the reason I tried to sketch out a little bit of the the downward slope earlier is for so people can watch that because I think if you continue to have the steps come out of the administration then the risks of systemic deterioration or deconstruction are much higher. A lot of that will depend on the Congress in the United States, the business community, agriculture, others who who may be out of this experience will sort of push back. Well, just going back to that idea of this transactional sort of uh, ethos that currently um, prevails in the White House, the idea of, as Peter Navarro often points out, looking at trade as a zero-sum game, the necessity to close that trade gap, will the type of tariffs that have been talked about overnight and signed into force, will they actually be enough to close the gap in Absolutely some of those not. sectors? I mean, so but, what's look, the... look, but let's take for order. <laughs> the, the, the United States trade deficit has increased over the past year. And, and if the United States grows because of some good tax policies or deregulatory policies faster than others, you're going to see the trade gap grow. If you pound Mexico and the peso falls, you're going to see the trade deficit grow. So look, at some point, you know, as we've been discussing, politics is important, but economics does have a say in this. So where is the economics leading us? Because Paul Krugman in the New York Times seems to suggest that obviously we're going to end up with a situation where we'll have uh, imported inflation in the United States, things will get more expensive, interest rates will have to go up, and then for Mr. Trump's uh, bodies in the real estate sector, it's not going to be good business either. It is, is that the likely economic scenario in a couple of years down the line, or is it far more complex than that? It's far more complex than that. <laughs> so you it, thought you might say the, that. The, 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 the variables that you're pointing to are variables that people will watch. And so, look, 
the, the, the odd thing about this is that in, in overall economic conditions around the world, things are pretty darn good. I mean, you know, you had all 45 OECD economies growing, about uh, 80% of the G20 economies were sort of growing faster than potential, inflation was down, interest rates are down. One big issue will be the exit from extraordinary monetary policies, but the types of scenarios that you cited or Paul Krugman cited, I'm, I, I wouldn't yet put my bet on those, but they're the types of things people need to be watching. And if, if you start to get a series of retaliations, if the administration pulls out of NAFTA or the Chorus Agreement, you know, if you start to, uh, the WTO appellate system sort of unravels, then those are gonna be risks that will be heightened. How quickly do you think those kind of risks will start to become apparent? I think they've started. I mean, so <laughs> the only good news I can find of this is that I wrote a piece in January warning everybody that got complacent last year to say, watch out, 2018 is going to be a bad year. Well, you know, I got that bet right. And, and my point is, th is that not only is it steel, but like watch this 301. Because having talked to the Chinese, to be honest, they weren't blocked much on this, this most recent action because of anti-dumping and countervailing duties in the United States that are already about 80% on Chinese steel. So, so they've only exported about 2% of the uh, steel to the United States. But they're quite worried, and justifiably so, that when there's a big bill of particulars in the 301 IPR, as there will be, then what will be the administration's response? If I had to guess today, but it's only a guess, I don't think the administration knows. I mean, look, you've had people resign over this issue. The president has adjusted a little bit over the course of the past couple days. But the key point I want to emphasize here is that for the president, this is not only, gee, I like this policy over another policy. It's based on his fundamental political base, which was people who want a wall with Mexico, people who want to stop immigration, people that want to stop trade. And he's been very shrewd in recognizing, unlike other politicians, he's going to say, I keep my promises. Okay? And he's not going to abandon those people. And that's one of the warnings that I've tried to make. And, and you know, he'll cut a little bit the edges. He, can, you know, he has the ability to redefine different issues. As you're seeing, you know, we'll see with North Korea and different things. But on this trade area, um, he's, he's had these views for a long time, and it's now part of his political momentum. Yeah, you've been saying that for some time, in fact. Um, let's take uh, one question first, the gentleman in the front row, and then we'll have a question from you, sir. Uh, Christoph von Marshall. I'm at the moment a fellow with the German Marshall Fund in Washington. And I would like to invite Bob Zollick on a thought experiment. It's a question I tried yesterday to get an answer from the administration, but got no answer. Um, if we go this direction, retaliation, re-retaliation, I fight, and then German cars, what is an American car? What is a German car? Is that at all possible to do that? Uh, is a BMW from Spartanburg a non-American car? Is a Ford produced in Canada or Mexico an American car? Uh, just from your point of view, is it possible in the real world, which is not analog, um, national, or foreign anymore, but it's intertwined. Is it at all possible to do this kind of retaliation, or is it not, and it's therefore rather an empty threat? So two points on this. The, the, the thought experiment will be a real experiment with NAFTA, because you really have a North American production market now. And parts will cross the border an estimated 13 times with Canada, Mexico, engines, others, as you're probably uh, well aware. So one of the things that goes back to my point about the Trump administration wanting to have the outcome readjust the rules is they're trying to add a, a rule of origin that will require US content. Now remember, the EU is a customs union. NAFTA is not a customs union. So it makes sense under NAFTA, where you have separate barriers, uh, in, in the three countries, that you need to have a NAFTA rule of origin. And I think Mexico and Canada could have a higher NAFTA rule of origin. But what the administration says, no, we want a certain percentage to be US. Well, that'd be equivalent to saying if we sell natural gas to Mexico, the 20% of the gas has to be Mexican. Or if we sell corn, the 20% has to be Mexican. So that will be the real live test of your issue. However, the second point I want to make, and this is important for Europeans to understand, is the way that President Trump or Wilbur Ross look at this is, is that basically they say, well, the tariff on cars in the US is 2.5%. The tariff on cars in Europe is 10%. The tariff on cars in China is 25%. How can that be fair? 
Okay. Now, what they don't fully account for is that is the way these negotiations have worked over time. The U.S. has a tariff on small trucks of 25%. Exactly. We have a terrible sugar program. So that's the way the system has moved forward. But that's a very hard thing to explain to people. You know, and, and, and that's where fundamentally the nature of their attack on this system, you'll hear reciprocity much more now, okay? And reciprocity basically means we'll have the same level as somebody else has, okay? Well, if the danger is that the trading system then goes to the highest level of protection, mm. where the whole notion over the past 70 years is we're trying to move to a lower level. And my caution is you're gonna see this in investment too. I just wanna come back to cars and the international supply chains, Commissioner mm. Manstrom, are an issue as well. I mean, companies like BMW just to sit, you know, single out one particular big German automaker, make cars in the United States. Are those kind of cars going to be subject to these, you know, tariffs, if indeed we have tit-for-tat trade tariffs on well, all we, sorts of other goods and issues? Or? Well, we hope certainly not, because the problem is is complex. We, we have around two, two and a half million cars made by European companies in the US. Uh, they employ American people. They are, I think, almost 60% are for export, so they bring money to the American economy. So it's very hard to say that, that, that these point out to, to these European cars because they are made very much in the US by US parts. And in, in an ordinary BMW or a Volvo, there, there are components from, 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 I don't know, 50, 60 countries. Well, when you make this point to your counterparts in the current administration, how receptive are they to Well, that? we haven't been able to talk about this particular issue yet. Presumably, when you when you will we on might, Saturday yes. tomorrow, um, be a long day tomorrow. You expecting yeah. them to be receptive to that, or are you expecting um, more blunt I, response? I don't want to speculate. <laughs> okay. um, let's take another question. There was a gentleman here. Thank you. Hi, my name is Simon Fraser. I'm managing partner with Flint Global. I used to work with Peter Mandelson when he was the Trade Commissioner and Bob no. was the uh, uh, USTR. Uh, can I go back to the UK question very briefly? And I just question for Bob Zellick. Imagine that this uh, dispute had arisen two years from now, when the UK was out of the EU, or a bit longer, when we were no longer in a transition period. Do you think, given the attitudes of the present US administration, there would have been a temptation to exempt the UK, uh, and the, the question behind that is, do you think there's a risk that the US will use the UK's different position as a leverage point in its strategic trade uh, relationship with the EU, uh, and how could that possibly evolve? So, let me start by pointing out that, look, this goes to the old-fashioned systemic interest. It, it's in the interest of the United States to try to have the Brexit process that people in Britain have decided on to be the most successful as possible for Britain, Europe, and the world economy. So if I were in the US government, I'd be trying to figure out, based on their decisions and what happens, to kind of ease that process. And this is a bigger issue as you start to get to some of the questions about how the EU will negotiate with Britain. And in the old days, the United States would have to be careful about this, but maybe it could play some mediating role on some of these areas. That's not what's gonna happen now. <laughs> and, and, and your question's a really good one. I think the short part would be, yes, they'd be tempted because President Trump always thinks of leverage and he's thinking if it could give him some sort of uh, point. But there's a countervailing point, which you've already seen, which is some in Britain have thought, well, the United States is gonna make it easy when, for example, there are various quotas of products for the European Union, and those now have to be renegotiated. And of course, Britain and Europe said, well, let's just renegotiate them based on the proportion we import. Well, the US and Australia and Canada and others said, no, 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 that's not a sort of fair allocation. So this is gonna end up being a lot harder than people think in terms of reallocating some of the WTO arrangements uh, for the EU. So the administration will feel pushed and pulled on that issue. But I, if I were in Britain these days, I wouldn't feel too confident about sort of the reliance on the United States as you go through what's going to be a historic change. And I'm sad to say that. And this goes back to the question that so we were asked about the systemic thing. The United States should be trying to help players in this. And look, it's not just being gracious to everybody. If the system does well, the United States will do well. But if you have to fight the United States tit for tat on trade and it's the world's biggest economy, their argument might be, well, we're the world's biggest economy. So who else 
but yes. really make up a point. <laughs> but they are you not the it. only economy. <laughs> and at the same time as this is happening, what is happening in the rest of the world? Yesterday, very timely, 11 countries, led by Japan and others, signed the TPP. Why did they do that? Because they said, OK, we are sorry the US left, but we want to go on. What are we doing in the world? We are closing trade agreements with others. Our Japanese agreement will hopefully enter into force very soon. We have closed negotiations with Singapore and Vietnam. We are very, uh, about to close with Mexico and Mercosur, which will be huge trade agreements uh, uh, when, when they are, especially the, the, the Mercosur agreement. We're negotiating with Indonesia. I just came back from a meeting with ASEAN trade ministers, and we reaffirmed our joint commitment because of the things that is happening in the world, that we want to work jointly for a regional uh, trade agreement in the future. We are making the, the, the different uh, analysis and stepping stones uh, for that. Because a, a growing circle of friends of trade in the world is realizing that we want to trade. We want to get rid of those tariffs. They are, they, they, they are not there. We want to set global rules. We want to increase the possibilities for us to trade, for our people to meet, uh, for, 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 uh, to, to harness and shape globalization to make sure that we get proper jobs, that we get uh, fair trade, sustainable trade, and also, because of the title of this uh, meeting is today, how can we regain trust? All of these countries, and many others, agree that we need also to make sure that trade is sustainable. Because this is what people ask today. They want to trade, yes, but they also want it to be fair, sustainable, to live up to certain international rules on, on ILO conventions and sustainable development. And this is what's happening in the meantime in the rest of the world. But, but Dina, can I just, you, 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 your questions, and I don't want to lose it because it's a critical question. And you planted the seeds of the answer when you talked about zero sum. And, and so remember, the United States had a trade surplus in the Great Depression. So you want trade surplus? Great, 25% unemployment too, right? So the point is, do you see the world economy in a zero sum, where it's kind of bilateral trade deficits, even worse than a global trade deficit or surplus, or do you see it that you're trying to grow something and that you benefit from that? That's the fundamental distinction. So if, if I were in office, I'd be focusing on employment, wages, productivity, inflation, as opposed to sort of bilateral trade deficits. And the bilateral trade deficits, again, just for, it, it's sometimes people have a common sense sense of saying, well, why shouldn't these be balanced? The example I can give you is I have a bilateral trade deficit with my supermarket. But I don't go and stock shelves at night to create the offsetting surplus. I try to make money somewhere else and pay for it. The US has a surplus with Australia. Australia has a surplus with China. China has a surplus with the United States. So what have we learned? We've learned that there's something called comparative advantage. Mm -hmm. But it's not an easy concept for people to grasp. And what you it, can see with Trump is he's been doing this for 30 years, starting with Japan. It, it's also, Bob Zellick, I hate to say it, a concept that some people would describe as patronizing. Isn't it? Is, is that not the issue? <laughs> How can of, it be patronizing to have an economic to, But it's difficult to explain that without necessarily um, your average worker believing that some of those arguments are patronizing because their, their question will be, how does it hit me in my pocket on a day-to-day -day basis? Well, I don't think an answer on economics is patronizing. If your belief is, is that you're supposed to dumb down to talk to people, I think you're being patronizing. No, I'm, I'm, and so I'm, my I'm argument... Just, I, I, as the journalist, am relaying the and, kind and of narrative that you hear when you do this talk to people about trade. The answer to the question that you ask is, do you have to try to explain to people and help people with the motivation, uh, help people adjust to change? And look, when I was trade representative, I went with one congressman uh, to five different small establishments where the they exports were a key part of their business. Um, and by the way, imports are important too. Remember, 60% of US imports are inputs into other products. So yes, you have to explain it. And frankly, this goes back to a problem that predated Trump. And here, you know, you could, you could ascribe the responsibility to many people. President Obama banned the use of NAFTA because he saw it as politically bad. So guess what? <laughs> if, if one side is the only part arguing a case, you're gonna 
have a problem. Despite that, and this is important if you want to talk about public attitudes, the last poll that I saw showed that only 14% of the American public wanted to leave NAFTA. The polls are actually showing increased support for NAFTA. It was up to about 57%. If you look at whether the American people say that trade is good for consumers, 78%. If they say that it's good for jobs, 57%. If they say for it's good for the economy, 72%. So the problem is the intensity of voters who feel that they're sort of losing out. And that goes to the questions that you were asking before. How do you help people adjust to change? But it's a very critical ar argument, Nina, because you've seen this with a lot of politicians. The easy path is to empathize and say, yes, we'll block stuff, okay? And what we've tried to talk about here is, I don't think that's gonna lead you in a constructive direction. So the real political challenge is to explain some of this and help people. Um, I want to take a question from the lady here who ha ha has been waiting for a question. To, to Bob Zerlik again, and thank you for, for these presentations. Could you add to your reasoning the, the impact, the global impact of fiscal reform? Is fiscal competition part of a strategy in global economic relations or not from the US standpoint? Um, I don't think it's part of a competitive strategy other than there was a, our corporate tax system was terrible. And so I think that the corporate tax reform will make the United States more competitive. I don't think that's directed against others. You could argue the personal tax side of this reform has got some questions. The bigger problem there is that it's added to the deficit. But I don't think that's seen as competition against others. I think that's the cheap way to get the reform, and eventually somebody's gonna have to pay the piper as debt gets paid. But right now, the politics in the United States are unwilling to act very much on the deficit. <clears throat> Let me take a couple of questions on this side of the room. Uh, you have a question, madam, and then we'll take your question. Thank you. Uh, I'm Anna Wieslander with the Atlantic Council, uh, Stockholm office, I should add. Uh, and uh, I have a question on systemic leadership. Uh, so if uh, this is right, that the US is not so keen on leading this system anymore, uh, who will replace uh, them? And my mind goes to the EU uh, as a super soft power. Uh, Super soft power. Is the EU really <laughs> is the EU ready to lead a systemic? Not only, as you say, Cecilia, uh, uh, being successful in in making regional uh, trade agreements, but one more level, taking taking global leadership on trade. Well, we are certainly trying to pay, play a, a role, uh, obviously, because the EU is a uh, one of the biggest economies, and we have some, some experience uh, in these issues. As I said, we are, are uh, negotiating with lots of, of uh, friends across the, the, the globe right now. We were very active in preparing and making proposals uh, in light of the WTO meeting before, before Christmas. Of course, of course, not alone, because we are still only 28, soon 27 uh, countries. So we are reaching out. But that's why I say we are building this coalition of friends across the world who want to trade, who, who who doesn't agree with the, the notion that trade is you lose, I win, but that you can make win-win uh, situation, that you want to strengthen global institutions and you want to set global, global rules. So we are certainly trying to, to play the, the, a strong role as we can and we will reach out to others uh, to do that and to underline not against the, 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 the US. They are our friends. We hope that they can come back uh, to, to work with us. But if, if the administration for the moment is uh, to a certain point logging out of this, if I can use that, that word, well, th the world has to continue. Can I, can I make one additional point on this that's really important for European audience? Um, and that is that uh, <clears throat> the United States has a president. It doesn't have a core leader like in China. So we have a Congress, we have states, we've got a private sector, and all those are gonna be important elements in sort of what comes out of this. So I, uh, we came in on, uh, just at the edge, but you, in the opening you heard a little comment from Kansas City, Missouri about productivity and others. Uh, and uh, there's gonna be an additional burden on the US private sector uh, that yeah, continues not only in the politics, but let's just, you know, we haven't talked about energy markets. So the energy markets have been totally transformed 
within, because of what happened in terms of U.S. innovation with sort of tight oil and fracking. And you're going to see this in various software and other areas. So as you think about the United States, it's important to realize you have to work the diverse elements of this pluralistic system. I'm not trying to give the administration uh, uh, an excuse on this, but I'll just point out that Canada and Mexico, for example, have figured this out. So as they're doing the negotiations, they're trying to get leverage points with the agriculture community and others. Let's take a question here. I believe Madam, you had a question. Thank you. I'm Gül Turan from the European Movement Turkey. I had two small questions. I was wondering how China itself would retaliate with what a, to all that is happening right now. And then one small question on how will this have an impact on investments and what do you expect to take place? Thank you. you want me to start? Um, well, I've, I've had a number of conversations with the Chinese recently and um, they don't want a trade war. No. Um, and they're, they're going to be very careful. But I think they've mapped this out pretty carefully. So when you had the original safeguards on solar and, uh, and washing machines, I mean, it partly benefited Chinese investment in the solar sector in the United States. Um, but you notice they did an investigation of sorghum. You know, they start, so, and it was kind of neat, right? So they didn't start on soybeans. They kind of sorghum, most people don't even know what sorghum is, but it's, the farm community knows what it is. So they're kind of signaling that, right? And you see, given these most recent sort of tariffs, as I mentioned, it hits them a little bit in aluminum and in steel, they're already sort of taken out of the market. So notice their response was even sort of more moderate that, uh, from, from the European Union. But on the other hand, given President Xi's position, they can't be walked over, so they'll send signals back. And what they're really watching is the one that I tried to alert your audience to here, which is the 301, because they don't know the sort of the scope of that. So in general, I think they'll try to moderate it, but they'll push back at appropriate points. On the investment, I'm glad you raised that, because you see, what I've been trying to also suggest is that you have a combination of issues here. You're now sort of bringing in national security in a much broader fashion, okay? You're already seeing the CFIUS process in the United States, interagency process run by the Treasury, sort of edging away from national treatment policy, which is the idea that you treat other investors like you treat your own, to a reciprocity policy, which is to say you treat them like the other guy treats them. And this is part because of the difficulties people are having in, in, in China. Then you're going to have a whole series of issues related to, to the technology and innovation. And then we're going to come back to the data privacy issues. So there are a number of factors here that I personally think run the risk of making poor investment investment more restrictive over time. And, um, and some of it, you know, you could make the argument with China on, on investment that, that there needs to be greater reciprocity here. The problem is, for example, there's legislation in the United States now, Senator Cornyn's put forward, to reform CFIUS. And while well, it starts with a good motive, which is that China's sort of ripping off of technology or compelling it, it would actually create a new technology control regime, not only for investment, but for joint ventures, for life licensing, a whole series of things. Now, there's pushback on this. The industry is pushing back. The House is taking a different view. But your question is a good one, and the reason I'm going into a little bit of detail here is that a lot of these decisions will be made over the next 12 or 18 months, and they matter. Now, we're just out of time, but I believe there is a question here just on the, in the, in the front yeah, row. Maybe, maybe a last uh, question, just as uh, an advice. Uh, I'd like to have Bob sense. If we want to contain this and to avoid that it leads to a total unraveling that, of everything that has been built. Should the European response and the Japanese, for that matter, lean more towards the thoughtful, measured, avoiding escalation? Um, That's what they're doing. It, it is it, thoughtful it, and measured. Yeah, or should it, should it uh, also lean a bit uh, towards the um, uh, bold, uh, aggressive uh, uh, tit-for-tat, uh, or is, it, is indeed uh, the measured way the best way? 
So shockingly, coming to Europe, I anticipated this question. Um, and, and, and of course, it's for Europeans to decide. Uh, but I would say, because I think in financial market terms, I think of portfolio approaches. So Europe has to do things that defend its own position and protect its rights, and it will decide sort of the combination. And I think what Commissioner Malmstrom has tried to outline without endorsing one thing or another, she's trying to deal with it in a measured fashion. But think about offensive as well as defense. So that's why I also think the idea of trying to open markets elsewhere, whether with free trade agreements or trying to approach the United States about working together on some of the innovation technology issues for China, look for areas where you can have a positive agenda as well as you know, what you have to do on the defensive side would be, would be my suggestion. That so, was the right answer, actually, because that's exactly what we're doing. Well, this is what I wanted to nail so, you both well down done. on. Um, <laughs> so you. at the Brussels Forum this year, we would like to try and sort of uh, get some commitments for action. So first to you, uh, Trade Commissioner, what would be your commitment to action to stand up for Europe in the face of what is now blunt protectionism, as per yesterday evening? Um, what action do you think you can commit to? Well to continue what, what we are doing, to continue to finalize the trade negotiations that we have with other partners, bilaterally or regionally, because this is important, uh, to continue uh, to, uh, to work with others to see what can be done within the WTO to strengthen it, to work with the uh, United States to try to frame, even if it's difficult right now, uh, on, on a positive agenda. Uh, to, to respond to, to a possible decision against us yesterday uh, as well. And as we didn't have so much time to, to talk about, to continue to work uh, on, on increased inclusiveness and transparency on our trade agreements, because we need to, to continue to build that trust among our citizens that trade is actually a very good thing for jobs, investment, and for, for people. And I commit to come back next year if you invite me. Oh, that would be fantastic. <laughs> we'll hold you to that one. Um, EU Trade Commissioner Cecilia Manstrom, thank you very much for joining us. Bob Zelik, thank you as well. And to our audience, thank you. I'll be handing back to Richard. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back to the stage Mr. Richard Louis.